Uh, tonight we're going to turn more to politics in a sense, Washington. We have Joe LaConte, who um, after um, born in Brooklyn and grew up in Long Island, and uh, we'll talk a little more about how he got to various places, but then he's been in Washington a lot for the past 20 years. So this seemed to be an appropriate time to uh, have this type of discussion since there is some event going on tomorrow nationwide. Um, but um, anyway, Joe, thank you for coming here. Thank you more for having me. Great to yeah. be here. Okay. Born in Brooklyn. How long did you spend in Brooklyn? Uh, you know, uh, this is, uh, I was the second baby that came along, and two babies in a, in a tenement, two screaming babies in a tenement was about enough for my mom, so we moved out to the island pretty fast after that, okay. to Long Island. So I'm really a beach kid, but you, you can take the boy out of Brooklyn. You can't take the Brooklyn out of the boy. All right. So, right, so grew up on, on Long Island, and then what? Uh, University of Illinois? University of Illinois for journalism. You know, I was trying to get, uh, figure out a good reason to go to, like, one of the coastal colleges, California or Florida, for journalism. I just couldn't justify it, so I wound up in the Midwest, <laughs> freezing my rear end off at Champaign-Urbana. And um, as a New Yorker, it was, it was a bit um, out of my context, put it yeah. that way. Yeah. Um, there were a lot of comments about me every time I would uh, leave my dorm room. Everyone assumed I was armed. <laughs> And that would be the word on the street. It's the New Yorker, he's got a gun. He's got a gun. But it was a, it was a great time at Illinois. I, I went there for journalism. I got a, a great education and lived at the college, the, the college paper, which is a daily college paper, which is really where you learn the craft. You've got to just write every day and be edited by people who kind of know what they're right. doing. Right. That's why I chose Illinois. And you had grown up in an Italian Catholic family, and you can do good imitations of the Godfather and so forth. So did that, did that help to socialize the people around imitations? you in Illinois? What do you mean imitations? What are you talking about imitations? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, uh, what, did, what did you retain from that background? Well, that's a great question. You know, we have some terrific, I'd like to think at least, there's a little bit of this in, in me. We have some great storytellers in my family, an Italian, Italian family. And... Uh, so there's some of that kind of storytelling gene which lends itself to exaggeration, wild exaggerations. Uh, bodies winding up in, in trunks, uh, faces winding up uh, down in the minestrone soup, you know, those kinds of stories. Right. Uh, so there's some of that in the, in, the, in the bloodstream. Storytelling then helped you get into journalism. Yeah. I mean, and, of course, there's no exaggeration in journalism. <laughs> so so why do you want to be a journalist? You know, in the, if you think about the 1970s and all, uh, the post-Watergate uh, era, uh, a lot of young people, and I was one of them, you got kind of caught up in the idea of being a reporter, being a journalist, and bringing down a presidency. Kind of cool, you know? <laughs> That's kind of what we thought going into the thing in the 70s. And uh, so I got, I got caught up in it. I, and, and I had a journalism professor in high school who really encouraged me. He was terrific. Another Italian guy, Gerald Maggi. And he used to start the class out by uh, reading selections in the New York Times and then just throwing the newspaper up in the air in utter disgust for whatever reasons. I don't know. But anyway... <laughs> Uh, he was very encouraging, and so off to, to, to journalism then to try to kind of change the world as a, as a young guy. Okay, so you graduate from Illinois, and then you go to Wheaton for a master's. Yeah. Master's in? In uh, Christian history and theology. Why that? You know, I'd been in the world of journalism for several years, uh, newspaper journalism, doing different things, and I, I went into it very much apart from any kind of Christian faith commitment. But by the time I got to the University of Illinois, that's where I would say I became a, a Christian believer, embraced the gospel, uh, I've been a Protestant ever since, deeply grateful for my Catholic background, Catholic family and all. Um, but soon into the journalism thing, I really wanted to write in order to influence, not just to write to inform uh, people, but to really help shape how people think about some pretty cr crucial issues. And I just knew as a young guy, I didn't have the theological background. I didn't have the grounding in Christian theology. So I thought, well, i got to take some time, step back from the professional track, take at least a, a year or two and uh, get, some, get some good theology under my belt, so I went to Wheaton. Okay, so let me just back up for a moment. Yeah. So how did, that, how did that spiritual change occur at Illinois? Well, uh, there are two people in particular who were very instrumental. One was a girl I was dating at the time who uh, was getting serious about her faith, and to her credit, she realized I wasn't and dropped me like a hot potato, which was just the right thing to do. That got my attention. And then uh, I had a Muslim friend, Arif Qureshi from Pakistan, who'd become a Muslim. And uh, he'd become a, he'd become, I'm sorry, he'd, he'd become a Christian. He was a Muslim, become a Christian. And uh, he wrote a long letter to me after I came back from drinking a little too much one weekend, which is kind of what you did at the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana. Long winters. Long, long, long winters, long, cold, bitter winters. And uh, a letter about uh, his relationship with Christ and 
something I should think about. So the combination of those people who I both of them I really liked and respect and, and respected and all that, that really got me thinking and getting getting involved with a with a Bible study and for the first time getting into the scriptures and and really s understanding the gospel for the first time. That was the crucial thing there in sophomore year in college. Okay. Yeah. Did the young lady ever come back into your life? Uh, not in the way I would have liked. So, all right, all right. <laughs> Another one that got away. All right. Okay. So. Um, did you go to Wheaton because you, you really wanted to find out now what this, what this all meant? or? Well, I think I wanted to be able to go back into journalism, really, and write with a little bit more credibility. Because we, Wheaton is kind of a Protestant Vatican. Uh, <laughs> a Protestant way. Vatican, that's right. Billy Graham, uh, front and center over there. We that's genuflected right. the Billy Graham statue over there right. at Wheaton. And C.S. Lewis is the patron saint, really, right. at Wheaton, no question about it. Has the wardrobe. And has the wardrobe, that's right. And yeah. so, it's uh, actually, actually there. <laughs> Yeah. So it was really the idea of get, getting the sort of uh, theological and then spiritual formation that you couldn't get in too many other places. I didn't want a seminary degree because I knew I wanted to be more engaged in the kind of public life, political, public policy issues. But I really wanted to do it from a position of intele intellectual strength. What has the Christian tradition said about certain issues over time? What are the big issues in Christian theology you need to be aware of? And who might be some you know, role models and, and, uh, and whatnot from, the, from Christian history to, th to think about and to learn from? So which role models from Christian history impressed you? Well, a number, you know. I mean, cer certainly we put C.S. Lewis on the list, and we'll come back to him. But I think even more recently, um, Charles Malik, who was a Lebanese mm -hmm. uh, ambassador to the United States, a, a believing Christian, uh, Arab, Lebanese guy, involved in the whole debates about the formation of the United Nations, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the quest for religious liberty, and he was an intellectual powerhouse on the UN Human Rights Commission when it was created. Served on a, a very important committees in the UN and he just spoke truth to power. It was really a, an astonishing a period for, for, for this man and for his influence as a Christian with all the limitations, the way he influenced the outcome of the human rights debate in the UN, we are benefiting from that today. Mm -hmm. And just quickly, th the example would be that there's an article in the UN Declaration, Article 18 on religious liberty, which is really modeled on James Madison and the First Amendment. It's a pretty robust statement about religious freedom, and that we owe to Charles Malik because he fought for it like nobody else did. So that, he, he's been a, a kind of hero for me over the last several years especially. Okay. So then you have this deeper understanding of Christian history and various role models, and then off you go to Washington? Yeah, I was kind of in Washington doing the think tank thing for a while, realizing that I needed to, needed to kind of withdraw and get some theology, then I went right back into D.C. Okay. and worked over at Policy Review magazine. Okay, at the Heritage Foundation. At the Heritage Foundation, right. Okay, and what did you do at Policy Review initially? I was the number two guy, the editor at Policy Review, the deputy editor. Got to edit uh, a couple of Marvin's articles. That was a great privilege. Required heavy editing, I should say. <laughs> yeah. No, they did not. No. Um, All those grammatical mistakes. <laughs> That's right. And I'll, I should tell the story how I met you, actually, uh, Marvin, in a minute, if, if, if you allow me sure. to do that. Okay. Uh, but the policy review, you're basically, the great thing about editing, I, I, I'm not an editor now, but the great thing about editing is it, it, it forces you to be a little less selfish because a great editor has to be able to work with this material in front of him or her and draw the author out, draw out the best that they have to offer rather than kind of establishing your own voice. Um, and that's, that's a different kind of discipline and just kind of figure out how do we take what this person has and turn it into something really that's a gem. But I met Marvin, I should just say, because it was part of my own uh, kind of intellectual journey, when you had, I think you had just finished the book, Tragedy of American Compassion. Okay. You'd given a talk, by, at any rate, at, at the Heritage Foundation back in 94, 95, I don't remember exactly when. And you talked about the uh, principles of compassionate giving in the 19th century, how Christian organizations and charities were deeply involved in that work. And, and a heritage crowd, it was a very secular crowd at the time, and then by the end of your talk, you talked about the Christian gospel and how decisive that is in people's lives and transforming their lives. And the room just got very, very quiet. Mm. And you just spoke with boldness and conviction. And I remember thinking, and I did this, I've got to meet that guy. Mm. Because I never heard that kind of message at Heritage, uh, or mm. in, much in the conservative world then, uh, back in the 90s. And we met briefly then, and then we you know, struck up a friendship. Right, and then you were writing articles. Yeah, for Policy Review, yep. Articles on? Uh, religion and politics, uh, all kinds of issues, but you know, everything from, uh, you know, drug treatment programs, uh, drug abuse I issues, faith-based initiative uh, kind of stuff, the role of religion in, in civic life. I think the first article I did was a Christian case against school prayer. 
hmm. which might uh, ruffle some feathers here, but it was the, basically the Christian case against um, principal orchestrated, state orchestrated, state led school prayers. Voluntary prayer from students is a different thing, but uh, it was a controversial piece. Uh, I should probably say parenthetically, even though we're on the record, I will say uh, that piece, I had a particular uh, fellow come in my office, uh, a name you'd recognize, a uh, religious conservative, um, and I had quoted him in the article, uh, The Christian Case Against School Prayer, and apparently his constituency did not like the fact that he was quoted in this piece, and he shows up in my office with one of his associates who looked like a guy who was an extra from the set of The Sopranos, <laughs> you know, like Vinny with no neck. <laughs> ready to just take me out uh, to kind of talk some sense into me about this article, very displeased, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, you have to just uh, do what you think is right and, and let, the chips, ch let the chips fall. Because so. this, this has become kind of a conservative staple to attack the Supreme Court for the 62 decision, yes. right, and, yes. and so forth. And, yes. and, uh, a recurrent theme in the culture wars was the issue of school prayer, especially in the 90s. So uh, they were not pleased. These partic particular Christian conservatives were not pleased with how they were quoted. They were quoted fairly, but, you know. And so at the Heritage Foundation, uh, how much leeway did you have to develop some positions and ideas of your own? In other words, is, was it a think tank where only a couple of people were supposed to think? Or? <laughs> you know, it's, any organization as large as the Heritage Foundation, which is 200 staff, all kinds of departments, $35 million budget, and larger now, I think, $40 million. Uh, it, it's different from department to department. I happen to work with Adam Meyerson. We were talking about Adam, a great editor who gave me incredible latitude and freedom to chase these issues uh, where, uh, where I could chase them. And if they, if they violated conservative orthodoxy, whatever that was, uh, that was okay as long as we did that with integrity. And I had that, that oasis there of protection for quite a while at Heritage. Didn't quite have it the way I would have liked n near the end of my tenure, but that's the way these things go. But generally, I'd say real freedom to you know, say some some sober things about the importance of religion in society, but also the importance of keeping government out of religion. Some hard things that have to be said about that, maintaining that separation. So let's talk about the realities of being an evangelical conservative in Washington. Yeah. Uh, what are some of the pressures? What are some of the opportunities? What did you find? Because you, you were there really from the early 90s through just, what, several years ago? What, uh, when did this all... With the Heritage Foundation the Heritage in particular? Foundation. I was there for about 14 years at Heritage, okay. actually, yeah until about three years ago, yeah, okay. with Heritage, then went to another think tank after that. Right. Uh, you know, um, the evangelical, here's the thing I would say, and we've talked about this a little bit, Marvin, is that one of the untold stories in Washington over the last eight to ten years, particularly beginning with the Republican Revolution uh, there in the Congress, 94, right, you have, you have had since 94, in a way I have, did not see prior to that, you've had large numbers, significant numbers of Christian conservatives, a lot of them evangelicals, coming into government at high levels, important strategic levels, either in the Congress as legislative aides, legislative directors, communications people, or in various government offices um, in the State Department. If you think about the President's faith-based initiative, I think there are 11 faith-based offices, or maybe it's 13, I can't remember, 11 or 12, uh, faith-based offices within the various agencies. Well, who do you think has been staffing those faith-based offices? Not certainly exclusively, but evangelicals have been in those faith-based offices throughout the federal agencies, Department of Labor, Department of Education, and then, of course, in the State Department, doing all kinds of foreign policy stuff that they would not have had the opportunity to do uh, really eight or ten years ago. So there's been a quiet, I would argue, a quiet revolution, uh, a, a kind of cultural change in Washington. Who knows what's going to happen tomorrow? But at least up until now, a cultural change with Christian conservative influence at the agency level, particularly in government, which really matters at the end of the day uh, given how these regulations, government regulations, can play themselves out, the agencies have a lot to do with that. And not all, n not as much was accomplished, let's say, as some of us hoped, but certainly these folks got a lot of experience. Yeah. And at some point they'll probably be back, right? Is yes. That, uh, uh, one friend of mine recently referred to this as sort of, and um, he, he wanted to be careful about overstating the case, but think about the sort of diaspora when the Christian church was persecuted there in the book of Acts, and then just they're sent out from Jerusalem. And there's a little fear of that or talk about that now among Christian conservatives in Washington. It's going to be a little, another diaspora sent out to various places, which can be a, actually a very healthy thing for those Christians then to be forced into other positions. They may have stayed in, in Washington longer, say, if there was a Republican administration. If there's a Democratic administration, they're going to have to find other work. And maybe that's very much in part of God's good, you know, God's good will uh, for them to move into other positions uh, in the think tank world, in the NGO world, et cetera. And so what was like, I mean, living in Washington, 
Um, still there. Still, still there. <laughs> still there. You have a, you have a house just that off little Capitol house Hill. There. That little broken down townhouse, yeah. Right. And so what's the, okay, what's the, what's the social life for, uh, for young Christian conservatives? And by the way, you know, most of our senior fellows, well, all of our senior fellows so far have been over 50, and for a whole lot of reasons, uh, uh, including uh, we had that, uh, that one New York Supreme Court justice who uh, decided not to come, and he, he would have actually increased our average age since he was in his uh, early 70s. <laughs> but Joe here is not quite 50. <laughs> um, so, you're, you're, so, so, so tell us. Tell us about, about you young folks in, uh, in Washington. Yeah, being a sort of Christian lounge lizard in Washington. Right. That's, that's my that's, goal. That's the question Hanging I want. Hanging out yeah. in a smoky jazz club, the lounge lizard I've yeah. always longed to be. Um, you know, I think uh, the great thing is you've got a lot of different Christian churches, different fellowships going on, a lot of small group activity going on. Uh, on Capitol Hill, off Capitol Hill. Uh, the gr one of the great things about Washington, I, I don't know New York obviously as well, is that it's not that difficult to meet with people during the week in their homes, you know, in their mm -hmm. townhouse, in their little patio on the back. I've got a little patio on my back. So, for example, in my backyard. So we'll, uh, we'll, I do a little monthly discussion, a little C.S. Lewis and Linguini. We call it Lewis and Linguini. I cook a little pasta. We have people bring desserts and plenty of wine and other uh, spirits. And we just have a good discussion. I hope that's all right to say here. Uh, and it's, on, it's on film. It's, it's on right. film. It's captured now for yeah. film for posterity. Um, a little sambuca, a little amaretto, and um, <laughs> and uh, we, we don't we don't have to go into all <laughs> the <laughs> <details. laughs> <That's laughs> right. Uh, and we just have we have a good meal first, and then we have a good hour long or so discussion about uh, a great C.S. Lewis essay, which has contemporary application, and that's great fun. And that kind of stuff goes on in Washington. Those kinds of discussions go on in Washington in small groups and. And then, of course, the great thing in Washington is you have obviously not all the culture you have in New York, New York, but you have probably all the cultural activities you have time for or money for. So you have, you know, you've got the Kennedy Center, all, all kinds of theater uh, and arts there and, and symphonies, orchestras, um, uh, jazz clubs and all. And D.C. is a very livable sort of city. And there are some new churches in, in inner D.C.? That, yeah, that, that I mean, uh, I belong to a church, Grace D.C. Church, which is kind of a plant of the Tim Keller Church, Redeemer Presbyterian Church. We're kind of a, a D.C. plant. We've only been around five years now or less. Living, um, uh, meeting in Chinatown in, a, in another church, building there in Chinatown, which has really come along as a, as a part of town over there. Great development going on in the city. So a lot more opportunities, I think, just in terms of socializing in the last ten years in the city uh, than there was uh, prior to that. Okay. So good years at Heritage, did a lot of writing, yeah. uh, but then it, had, then it ended. Yeah. Okay. All good things come to an end. Okay. And then what? Well, you know. Ethics and public policy. Uh, yeah. You know, when you, after being in a place for a while, you start to think, especially when you get in your 40s, you start to think, okay, the second half of my vocational life, what has been my sense of calling up until now as best as you can discern it? And the great thing about being where you people are in life is, you know, you're not going to have laser beam clarity about what God's calling is on your life. Most of you are not. You're just not. But most of us aren't wired for that kind of clarity. We just we blunder along with the grace of God and the prayers of others. We get a, a sense of our giftedness. We have a sense of what those opportunities are. We have friends who speak into our lives. And then we take steps of faith and we test it out. And we gradually discover, I think, what our calling is. So, you know, after being in this journalism public policy business for a while, leaving Heritage, it was a chance to step back and think, what do I want to accomplish with the second half of my vocational life uh, before God that I think is going to be more interesting, more fun to do, closer to what, may, what, what my heart is, um, what sorts of things I haven't done enough of. Teaching is, is you know, near, <laughs> right at the top of the list, uh, getting involved in teaching in some way. Uh, I've always thought about that and have had m small opportunities to do it. Uh, so you think through the whole calling issue again in a major way uh, is what I've been doing. And so post-heritage has been uh, testing out another think tank, ethics and public policy. Now in the last year I've been at Pepperdine University as a visiting professor writing and teaching over there in lovely Malibu, where the surf is always up and the sun is always, uh, is always out and everyone's tan and good looking and, uh, and uh, lots of distractions. And uh, it's been a great, um, uh, we're editing the tape, right? And, uh, but a great experience there on the campus, very serious school, uh, really serious students, I should say, more serious than I thought going in over there in, in Malibu. Um, and uh, the students there do have a great international experience, some of them from California. They've traveled to Asia. Some of them have been served in the third world countries, or I should say developing world countries. So it's been uh, it's feeling my way on that front. Okay, so, so how do you discern a calling at this point? What, what uh, yeah. well, just tell us about the, the thought process. And the reason I'm asking yeah. is that um, 
I was sitting in a meeting uh, this afternoon of uh, uh, our parents' council, and uh, I was talking with them for a while about things that are going on academically, and, uh, and right before that, Eric Bennett, our dean of students, yeah. was just mentioning that, I guess, in last year's senior class, 87% uh, of those graduating knew what their next step was, which is, you know, a, a, a good figure, very, yeah. very unusual yeah. among many colleges yeah. where people just wander. Yeah. Uh, so maybe we can figure out our, our next step, but what about figuring, or do you ever figure, you know, five years, ten years? Uh, have you ever had any plans? I mean, I haven't had any plans like that, but I am in awe of people who actually do yeah. have that stuff. I've never been on the five-year, the Joe Stalin five-year plan, you know? Right. Uh, and I think probably that one of the reasons I've never really been inclined that way is does, does that leave open enough space for God to surprise me and change my mind? Uh, if you have a five-year plan, it seems to me that could, the, the tendency is it, put, it puts God in a box. Yeah. Now, you've got to have goals, you've got to have objectives, you've got to take concrete steps to meet those objectives. But, you know, what are the indicators in our lives about what our gifts are? Well, and this will be common sense, I think, to you guys, and pretty intuitive. Uh, when you th when your mind when you're is free to kind of wander when you're in a good place emotionally kind of feeling good about life and hopeful about life right don't think about your calling when you're in the doldrums think about it when you're hopeful about life and then think about all right when I imagine myself in a certain role doing certain things does that bring instantly does that bring a sense of enthusiasm does it add to my hopefulness does it bring a sense of excitement and and, and maybe a little rush of joy or not as best as you can discern, as early as you are in the, in the, in the game. Uh, that's one clear thing. Obviously, you've got to start to think about, well, what do I have some giftedness in? It's one thing to be excited about a concept. I mean, I get excited about, you know, jazz clubs, but I don't play any jazz instruments. I'm not going to be a jazz performer anywhere. Um, so I've got to think realistically, well, what am, how am I gifted? Natural gifts and spiritual gifts. And how do you find that out? Yes, you can take all the diagnostic tests. Those can be useful. You just got to get in there and do it. You got to have friends who are honest enough to tell you uh, if you ha if they think you have a gift to affirm it, to give you some serious advice. If you don't, be willing to tell you if you don't. So that's yeah. crucial, right? And is it um, which is which is more prominent? What you what you like doing, or what you think you like doing, or what you're good at doing? It's hard for me to separate the two. Yeah. It's really hard for me to separate the two. Uh, but even saying that, I mean, I've been writing, you know, for 20 years. And writing has its element, as for those of you who know who, who are trying to do it well, it, it, and Marvin, you know this, it's hard work. There's a lot of hard work and, in a sense, drudgery. There's a certain stage you get to, for me at least with writing, where you break through and then it becomes really fun. You've got the first draft out and now you're working it over like the Michelangelo, just working it over, man, just putting the finishing touches on. That's when it becomes fun and exciting. But up until that point, it's hard work. Mm -hmm. And it may not feel so, and you may not feel so enthusiastic about that part of the process. doesn't mean you're not good at it, though. But there's a moment that should arrive when there's a real sense of deep satisfaction with the thing that you're doing for the joy of it. This is where, C this is where I think C.S. Lewis is so good when he talks about, you know, our work doing it for the sake of excellence, not for the sake of any kind of uh, earthly reward, earthly praise. That's just the consequence of the, you know, the icing on the cake for the thing. You do it for the, just the sheer um, joy of doing something well, using your gifts uh, in service to God and His kingdom. And that's, it takes, that's a challenging thing, to, I think, to, to maintain even when you discover what your gifts are, to do it for the right reasons. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. I guess my theory is that, uh, is that God does not pass out gifts, talents, willy-nilly. Yeah. I mean, there are some people who are omni-talented, but that's yeah. very, very rare. Yeah. You know, for the most part, yeah. uh, if we find one thing that we're really talented at, yeah. I mean, that's really good. Yeah. And as we pursue this, yeah. much like uh, Eric Little running, let's say, as we, yeah. as we write, perhaps, we, we feel God's pleasure as, as we get yeah. good at something. Yeah. Then, then we, the, more, the better we get at it, the more we enjoy it. Yes, Is that that's, that's really right. Yeah, that's really, really right. So. Yeah. <laughs> Maintaining that sort of disinterested sort of spirit. When I say disinterested, I don't mean uninterested, I mean the right motives. I'm chasing the d degree in music, I'm chasing the literature degree, I'm chasing the political science degree for the right motives. Because as you're going into public professions, quote unquote, where there's competition, where you're tempted to be looking around all the time at those around you who are further along, they're younger and they're further along, and then the, the, the kind of envy thing. Now, why are you in this profession in the first place? Is it to make a name for yourself, or is it to pursue this calling 
before God with ex excellence and integrity. I think that, that challenge, certainly not in Washington, which is such a you know, political town, a town about being known, right? Getting invited to the right parties, getting your byline in the right places. Um, it's a chronic yeah. temptation with, uh, yeah. with calling. Yeah, and you know, here's, here's where grades are useful, uh, that they help you discern your calling. Yeah. I mean, especially. I mean, we don't we don't have we don't have grade inflation here the way it, the way at some schools. Uh, yeah. So you know, grades are, actu are actually very useful. They can tell you what you're good at and what you're not good at. Yeah. And it is very useful to get bad grades in some things, yeah. as long as you're getting good grades in some things. It's useful in that sense because then you find out. Yeah. And it's 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 useful to try things and you know in jobs and and yeah. find out what you're good at and all. It's it's yeah. very useful to find out what you're bad at. Yeah. I mean, I am. Yeah. I am very grateful in a sense, although it was painful at the time, that I was cut from my sixth grade baseball team. Uh, <laughs> there was a certain message sent there that, uh, that I, 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 you know, I discerned. Um, yeah. So it was useful to find out that yeah. I just had no future. Yes, and, and, <laughs> I just had no future. You know, and, and that, and, and being a second baseman on the Boston Red Sox, no chance. No chance. And I was a second string trumpet player in the band, and I was never going to make first chair, and I was just there for volume. That's the only <laughs> reason. Why are you laughing, people? I was just there for volume. Well, I, play, I played the trombone in my high school uh, marching band, and I could march. That's all I could do. Yeah. Couldn't play very <laughs> But uh, anyway, so yeah, this was useful. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so now you are 45? Seven. 47. 47. 47. You only look 45. Uh, 47. Okay, so three years short of our, of our senior fellow status. But nevertheless, you are a senior fellow. Um, and, uh, um, and so and now you're really at the point of you've, you've had great accomplishments as, as a journalist. Yeah. You know, all the really good articles and in top-notch publications. But now, yeah, what do you what do yeah. you do next? Yeah. So uh, yeah. So you're at the, you're at that point in yeah. a sense at a at this stage. I mean, yeah. I've accomplished, uh, having accomplished a lot that a lot of students are yeah. in a sense in their yes. senior years and so forth. Yes. I mean, you know, yeah, you've you've passed, you've you've done you've done well, gotten good grades. But then what's next? Yeah, the process is not that different. In principle, it's the same s sets of issues you got to face. Thinking through the sense of calling the next steps, the practical decisions you have to make. But also, you know, especially when you're young, you got to chase your dreams. Yeah. You know, there are some dreams probably I'm going to have to let go of at some point. They're just not going to happen on this side, right? I'm still hanging on to some dreams. Teaching is one of them. And especially when you're young, uh, youth forbids you, forbids you to start tabling dreams. It just There's no reason to be doing that now. You know, I've been reading this little book by John Ortberg. If you want to um, walk on water, you got to get out of the boat. You guys maybe have seen that book. Terrific little collection of his sermons kind of strung mm -hmm. together. And he makes the terrific point about Peter getting out of the boat, walking on the water. He sees the wave and the winds, and he starts to panic, starts sinking like a rock. Jesus grabs him. They're in the boat. And we tend to think about Peter, the impetuous one. You know, he acts before he thinks. He's not deliberate enough. He's not cautious, careful enough. He's too impetuous, etc. cetera. Uh, but Altberg's point is, you know, there are 11 guys who never got out of the boat. Mm -hmm. What about those guys? Peter had the experience of walking on water. Think about that. Walking on water. Didn't last very long, but he had an experience that no other human being has had. And the, the guys in the boat who were warm, safe, and dry never had that experience. Now that, to me, is a, just a powerful, powerful story about pursuing your calling before God. Be willing to take risks. Be willing to get out of the boat, especially now. And, I, and I'm feeling the same kind of uh, questions and issues and challenges. Chasing a PhD at this stage in life. I probably should have done it 20 years earlier, but I'm doing it now. University of London. University of London out there, picking up some great British habits. Um, should I use one right now? Go Let right me think. Ahead, you know, they have an expression in Britain, which is just so funny. I'll just digress for a moment if I please. could. Just for a moment. And uh, uh, getting directions, and I have these little expressions that just come out in conversation. You realize you're not back in the States. And you're asking for directions to Trafalgar Square or something. And they'll say, well, you, you, you turn left, and you, you turn right, and then you, you literally turn left. And then you stop, and you say, well, what do you mean, literally? Do you make, is it a hard left? You literally turn left. <laughs> but, well, but what, is it a sharp left? Is it a, you literally turn left. I mean, that's just how they use the word literally, right? <laughs> just immediately. That's what they mean by literally. Immediately turn left. So little British things. But chasing your dreams in London or whatever city it is, whatever context it is, you've got to get out of the boat. And I, and I feel like that's an issue a set of challenges, decisions we're just going to keep facing throughout life. Are we going to get out of the boat? Or are we going to stay warm, <laughs> comfortable, dry, and safe? And that's just not good enough for most of us, I think. My worry is that conservatives will draw the wrong conclusions from 
a Obama victory. Uh, they, they will continue to do what they have been doing, many people have been doing, I think, in overstating his strengths, for one thing. Overstating his rhetorical abilities, overstating his, his kind of eloquence. I, I, I frankly think it's overstated. If you get the guy off of the monitor, um, if I could just speak, you know, rather um, bluntly for a moment. It doesn't mean, it's, it's not that he's not an intelligent man or, you know, a reasonably articulate guy, but by historical standards, we just need to kind of lower the, uh, lower, lower the, put it down a ratchet or so. Uh, he's not really walking on water in terms of his eloquence. And so I think that, uh, that one, one thing they could do, well, we have to just have a guy who speaks like Reagan again. Get that guy or woman in office, and that will help turn. So the lessons we draw from a, a potential Obama victory, I think, are really crucial. That would be one of them. Um, and then probably, you know, tearing down uh, and doing this sort of um, revamping and revisiting of, the, of the, the McCain campaign, all the flaws, the, uh, the, uh, the Palin, the Sarah Palin pick, was that smart, was it not? All of that kind of technical stuff which doesn't necessarily get to the root of the thing. And what I wonder is, uh, conservatism as a movement, politically, philosophically, and even religiously, well, are there lessons that have to be learned it, for the next election cycle that are not being learned and not likely to be learned unless some people convene? If there is uh, an actual coming together of conservative thinkers, this will be my hope. Bob Kaufman and I at Pepperdine were talking about this the other day. He's a professor over there. Conservatives, no matter what the election outcome, ought to come together and convene some thinkers, mm -hmm. and, a and activists as well, and have a kind of a brain trust and start thinking through where have we kind of gone off the rails when you think about where the country is and where it could be with conservative ideals and, cons and the strength of conservative institutions. So drawing the wrong lessons from the Obama uh, victory, if there is one, which is one of, my, one of my great fears right now. We hunker down and get into the whole uh, kind of holy huddle mode and uh, more embattled and more isolationist and all of that. You know, uh, and this is some of this, some of this is my British experience, uh, but there is something to be said for the fact that the Prime Minister has to face uh, members of Parliament every week uh, there in the dock and, and think on his feet. When it was Margaret Thatcher, was think on her feet. Uh, and yeah, a lot of the questions, the questions are more or less kind of known in advance, but there's always the element of the unknown. That's fun. And it's great fun. It's yeah. great sport. If you get to London, you've got to go. Uh, and, and, and watchable on uh, C-SPAN, right? C-SPAN, right? Yeah. Well, Minister, minister's questions, yes. Minister, uh, Prime Minister question time. Yeah. Yeah. 30 minutes. Absolutely worth doing. So there's a training. There's a sort of intellectual training that goes on for the political class, if we're just talking kind of politically here for a minute, uh, that goes on that doesn't tend to go on in our own political system for all kinds of reasons, right? And that's unfortunate uh, because... The need for persuasion now, persuasion, not just proclamation, but persuasion, is so crucial. I mean, look how long it's taken uh, the American people to kind of come to the conclusion that the war in Iraq has turned a corner thanks to the surge. I mean, that, it probably turned the corner long before the narrative actually changed. And the reason the narrative changed was not so much conservatives were making great arguments. Part of the reason the narrative changed, uh, a quick parenthetical is, a couple of people from a left of center think tank the Brookings Institution wrote an op-ed piece for the New York Times yeah. saying it's changed in Iraq on the ground. And that piece last year, if you remember reading it, it changed the debate in Washington about what was going on in Iraq. So the ability of conservatives to kind of think through a little bit better, how am I going to articulate the principle, and coming from a Christian perspective, the biblical principle, the political principle, and then the policy. Drawing, connecting the dots for people in ways that can be understood in our soundbite culture. We have very, very few people who can do that. I think that was probably one of, probably one of Governor Huckabee's uh, appeals, if you, if, you, if you consider that a strength for Huckabee. Certainly something he was trying to do more, sure. right? Uh, so that's one of the things I'd say, that ability to articulate the core values in a way that is understandable, graspable, and attractive. You know, attractive. So, you know, storytelling is important in all this. That would be uh, kind of related to that lesson is, you know, we've got to develop a different narrative, a different story of what, what, is it, what, would be, what would it be like to live in a more conservative political world for the average person? You know, Joe, uh, Joe uh, uh, Plummer. Plummer. Joe the Plummer. Joe the Plummer. I mean, why did that just take over this sensation? Because it suddenly embodied, incarnated a, a conservative principle, a real-life flesh-and-blood guy put, a, put the face on the conservative principle. Well, conservatives have to do a better job of that on a whole range of policy issues. Humanize it, humanize it, humanize it. Tell a story, but connect the story to the deep principle. You've got to do both. That's where Joe Plummer didn't quite help McCain as much probably as he could have in terms of 
the clarity of the principle, right? Yeah. I mean, this is why Reagan did so well, that he was able to tell those stories. And, and so connect it to it. Them, connect and connect it to the principle. Yeah. 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 yeah he yeah. did both. Yeah. See, Laurel? Um, I'm actually interested about your time at NPR <clears throat> and just your experience there. What yeah. do you feel it to be like working for them? Oh, uh, you know, and I wasn't on the payroll over there, but I was kind of on a regular contractual basis. So I would go into the offices over there, NPR, and do a taping, and you run, run into the usual NPR celebrity types. Um, uh, I enjoyed it. I thoroughly enjoyed it, I should just say at the outset. And I have, I have had reliably good, um, meticulous editors. Definitely of a, of a left of center, pretty hard left of center in some cases, worldview. I've had probably three or four different editors over there. And well, how long have you been doing that? You know, this last year was pretty quiet because of change in management, but right. I was doing it for about 10 years. And didn't hit every month with them, but that was the contractual arrangement. And, you know, sometimes they work in a lot, sometimes they don't. Um, I think the great challenge of it, and, I, and it's helped a lot, is a couple of things. Writing for radio is a different discipline than anything else. And if some of you guys know, uh, C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity was, developed, was a book that came out of a series of radio broadcasts during the Second World War, right? Making the case for Christianity, which one is the reason it's so lucid. It's so easy to follow the argument, because it was delivered to a radio audience, which means you cannot meander. There's no room for error. You have every word, every sentence has to be connected to the one before it, right? So that's what radio is, and you only have like 450 words of your commentary. So imagine that small space. That's like uh, two pages, two pages double spaced type. And you're trying to say something of substance to this audience that doesn't agree with your point of view. You can guarantee 90% of them don't, don't agree with your point of view. So you're trying to say something of substance in a way that can be understood. For that, and I saw it was a great discipline. My editors would keep forcing me back either to tell a story or to clarify, uh, clarify a point. Uh, and so I really enjoyed it. I think it honed my ability as, as an apologist, if you will, as a Christian apologist. NPR didn't realize that's what they were doing. Uh, but I was taking it. I was using it that way. Hone my skills as a Christian apologist. It was my take on NPR. It was great fun. Thank you for asking that question. About the, 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 the uh, necessity now of political types in a presidential campaign to make guest appearances on television and to use the entertainment media to their advantage. I just saw a piece in the Washington Post style section. Howard Kurtz, I think, did the piece. It's actually pretty fair-minded that McCain just did not get fair treatment on all the talk shows. I mean, this is a liberal New York uh, Washington Post uh, make, making the argument for McCain that he just simply was not treated the same way that Obama was on the various programs, whether it was the Colbert rapport or, you know, whatever it is. And now this is just part of the, the landscape. I wish, I, part of me wishes it wasn't so, of course, because I'm an inspiring historian. So I'm kind of out of the old school. Can't we get the Lincoln-Douglas debates, you know, back? You know, and it ain't going to happen, the Lincoln-Douglas debates. I wish they were, but they're not, it's not going to happen. Three-hour debates in central Illinois in the summertime. It's not going to happen. Without air conditioning. Without air conditioning. So now we have our, our political candidates going on these various entertainment programs, which carry, uh, have influence. I think that may be... Uh, I don't know, as important, but certainly an important part of this equation and getting the message out in a way that's savvy, speaks to young people. I mean, I heard one uh, friend, his wife, who was more liberally minded, was going to vote for Obama, saw John McCain on that um, comedy uh, presentation they did in New York uh, over here. The Alfred Smith Dinner. The Alfred Smith oh, Dinner, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The prepared remarks, the Alfred Smith Dinner. And uh, how many of you saw that, uh, that presentation, McCain and, uh, and Obama? I thought this was, one of, this was probably McCain's sort of finest political moment was the 15 or 20 minutes he did delivering uh, that sort of comic monologue. I thought it was terrific. Very human, clearly comfortable with his skin, the right kind of humor, not over the edge, but clearly just kind of poking fun gently at his adversaries. And he just seemed thoroughly comfortable with the whole thing. It was terrific. And this particular woman said she's voting for McCain. She was going to vote for Obama. She's voting for McCain. She, he, he helped clear away her reservations. Now, whatever that means, that's anecdotal. You can't draw any big grand conclusions from it. But I do think the entertainment industry is something conservatives are going to have to figure out. Get Fred Thompson in there and doing some coaching. I don't know. Uh, whatever you think about it, if you're inclined that way. Fred's campaign didn't go so well, but uh, maybe that's not the guy you want. Uh, when I look at some of these you know, talk shows, it's just so uncivil by intention and by design. I don't have a lot of hope for some of that. Now, Bill Bennett, for example, though, has been for the last several years on his radio program, Morning in America, has been trying to prove and demonstrate you can do serious, thoughtful, intelligent, civil radio. Uh, and I think he's been doing a pretty darn good job, got a decent market share over there, if I could say. Bill Bennett is a potential model in the broadcasting industry. 
Definitely, though, you need politicians who have some visibility. The problem is, you know, Americans, they don't know who this, they don't, who, who's a Sam Brown back from Kansas? You know, who's a pretty good, seems to be a pretty good spokesman on, on Christians and uh, human rights issues, sexual trafficking. But most Americans don't know Brownback. They don't hear, they don't get a chance to hear him. So who has the microphone now? We certainly could use, for example, when, when Christians find themselves in positions of influence, let's take, a, 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 I think, probably a mutual friend, Michael Gerson, mm -hmm. who was the president's chief speech write, writer there at the Washington Post. Mike Gerson is a voice for that. I think he is. And he's one of the guys I just make sure I read regularly. Um, he has an incredible platform that's great editorial real estate, as we say, the Washington Post op-ed page, and he's using it, I think, to the maximum. So when Christians, wherever they find themselves in positions of influence, if they can speak in that way, it's terrific. I'll give you one other example, which I think will be encouraging, especially because it's right at, at where you guys are in life. Uh, a young woman I know, Christian, evangelical, gr just graduated from a, I think, film school, a communications degree in, uh, at American University in D.C. She did a documentary called As We Forgive. Have you heard of this documentary? This is about r reconciliation in Rwanda generated by Christian leaders, Christian churches, forgiving those who are involved in, geno in the genocide. The documentary, I don't know, it's maybe less than an hour long, it won a national award, number one in its class. This woman was then interviewed by the, uh, by the Washington Post style section, front page interview about, on her. She then got an hour long program interview with the Diane Reem Show, which is nationally broadcast. She was terrific. And she's about 22 years old, 23 years old. Uh, just amazing. I mean, just a real maturity there. And the way she communicated her faith and why she got involved in this project, her heart for the, the Rwandan people, uh, and how she went about telling the story, for $20,000, she produced this film. Absolute shoestring. And she's already changed the conversation about the role of religion in reconciliation in some places. She's getting invited to conferences to speak. That's being faithful to your calling. That's taking a risk. That's, you know, going to your parents, your friends, saying, lend me money so I can make this documentary. I have no idea where it's going to go. And there it is. It's out there, and it's national recognition, some measure of national influence, really gracious in her whole approach and uh, it's just a terrific model for us as a young and person. She, and she's bilingual? I mean she can speak she can speak and understand Christianese and also yep. general discourse. Yeah, she, she's talking to a, you know, a Diane Reem audience which is a fully left of center audience and she's not, and I, I don't mean this in a demeaning way, but she's not just talking Jesus talk. She mentions Jesus, she mentions the gospel, uh, but it's a way that I think was incredibly winsome because Diane Reem would just come back with very, you know, kind of softball questions, taking it in and, and clearly impressed by her and said it a, a number of times on the broadcast how impressed she was with the work, with her as a person. So, you know, this can be done. It can be done by young people uh, who, are, who will get out of the boat. It does need to be done by the statesmen and, and others in various, you know, uh, industries and, and realms of public service and all that. Great question. Um, I teach a course on religion and public policy at uh, Pepperdine. Uh, which is uh, kind of a combination, the first half of it is history, uh, the history basically of, of religion in American democracy, right from the founding on, and then the second half we really get into the policy debates uh, the last 30 years, welfare reform, uh, the war on terror, the democracy agenda, radical Islam, that kind of thing. So it's part history, part policy. Theory, and then we, let, we finally land the plane in the last third, last half of the class. Um, I'd love to uh, do some kind of a variation on that I think would be important to do. I think I'd like to do a couple of things. I'd like to teach something on, and some of this in some form is already here at King's, uh, something on the Enlightenment and uh, you know, the, the roots of liberal democracy, particularly the religious roots of liberal democracy, could be kind of fun to do. Uh, I think something on religion and U.S. foreign policy could be kind of fun to do. Foreign policy in general is just fascinating now in a post-9-11 era. But I don't think you can teach a course on U.S. foreign policy and not talk about religion in a major way. I just don't think it's intellectually credible to do it that, that way anymore. You could do that in, a, in, the, uh, in the Kissinger era, you know, Henry Kissinger, the political realist, where religion in his 700-page tome on foreign policy, religion is not even in the index. You could get away with that in the Kissinger realm, in world, not in this world, right? So, of course, on foreign policy with religion as a strong element, that'd be great fun to do. Uh, uh, but relatedly, of course, religion and human rights, I think, is one of the incredibly important questions of our day. Uh, international human rights, I'm just uh, completely fascinated by, involved, have great friends in, in, in London doing terrific work. And the religious basis for human rights and democracy 
if that's a course or a variation on a course, the religious basis for, for human rights and democracy internationally conceived, that'd just be great fun to do. Terrific. I just think it's so crucial now to push back on the madness that we're encountering every day on that, on that theme. My sense of things is, having watched uh, the Bush administration pretty carefully over the last eight years and what's been happening with the faith-based initiative, having lots of great Christian pals in government trying to do some important things, being very familiar with the, what's going on in civil society, uh, with various Christian NGOs, uh, both domestically and internationally, I think his fundamental premise is wrong. I think he has overstated the, the quote-unquote, the problem with conservatism is hyper-individualism. I don't think that's been really the problem at all. I actually see... Uh, a, a growing commitment to uh, faith-based communities, moral communities, as part of the conservative movement. I think whatever you think of, of the, the results of Bush's faith in, uh, initiative, certainly this compassionate conservatism thing uh, is drawing into that Burkean vision, that it's not the isolated individual, it's people in moral communities, religious organizations, churches, congregations, religious charities, they are the most likely kind of organizations uh, that are going to come by uh, alongside people and rescue them from all kinds of depravities. And I was really disappointed, in, frankly, in Brooks's uh, kind of dismissal, for, for example, of vouchers. You know, why do conservatives push vouchers? He just, uh, Brooks dismissed that with schools, uh, public schools are having a problem, throw a voucher at the problem. You know, think about this. Every time there's a voucher initiative in any city, there are thousands of applicants who are trying, of poor families, African Americans and Latinos, who are trying to get that voucher for their kid. Why? Because they want their kid in a religious school. Why? Because the standards are different? Because that they're connected to a moral and religious community, right? There are discipline issues there in the in religious school that are different, and of course, a faith perspective. So the, the conservative approach, the, this conservative pillar, it seems to me, about education reform, uh, voucherize, break up the monopoly, uh, is a deeply Burkean idea, if you think about it, uh, and the importance of, of community. It's not radical individualism at all. So that's where I think um, Brooks is unfair to conservatives on this. I think he has this sort of Reinhold Niebuhr-like, uh, uh, well, the left says this and the right says this, and I'm going to say this. And he just takes it to kind of um, uh, an obsessive extreme. You know, th there are actually some things that conservatives are getting right and policies they're getting, I think, really getting right that have a good kind of even biblical foundation to them. And so there are other policies we could talk about, but that's certainly one I put on the table that I'm very hopeful about. Well, certainly, in the, in the immediate context is Marvin Alasky and the friendship. And, you know, Marvin was trying to kind of woo me down to the University of Texas, I remember, years ago, teaching some journalism down there. And this, you know, this New York boy with Texas boots, <laughs> you know, it just wasn't going to work. Also, uh, also trying to get you married off. Yes, he was trying to get me married off, too, yeah. And, uh, another, another futile effort, but uh, well worth noble, noble futile. <laughs> Keep hope alive, I say, though. Keep hope alive. Um, so, certainly, the, the friendship with Marvin, uh, of course, and then the more I got to uh, discuss Kings and what they were doing here at Kings, both from Marvin and talking to some others, of course, looking at the website and then talking to some people who've uh, been around the campus a bit, I think one of the distinctives, and we were talking about this earlier, the couple I could say, one, just by virtue of being in New York City, you're sending a message. You send a message to yourselves as an institution about your commitment to bring Christian ideas into the arena, just by virtue of being in New York and not being in Topeka with all due respect and love and affection for Topeka, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, we're not in Kansas, right? Um, it's a tough town here, friends. We know it's a tough town, right? Mm -hmm. I'll, share, I'll share another Brooklyn story in a minute. I shared one earlier today. I'll share another one in a minute. But um, So by virtue of being in the city, you're sending a signal to yourselves and to a watching world. That's a great thing to do, to physically locate here, because it's a constant reminder. You've you got to look out the window, and you realize we're in the mass mess of humanity, the mass and the mess of humanity, and we have to speak their language. We can't just do kind of hold hands and share precious promises in the church basement <laughs> and, and, ha and have, you know, cold pizza and, and flat Coke, you know, <laughs> and call it fellowship, right? It's just not going to work, right? Not in this town it's not going to work. It's got to, it's, the fellowship has to be deeper. The thinking has to be tougher in this town. And again, that's not to slight any other places. But just by virtue of where you are, that's really crucial, really important, I think. And then when I think about the sort of the philosophy, the, the educational philosophy, getting grounded in some big ideas, a series of big ideas, is really crucial. That's actually what we're doing over in Pepperdine in the School of Public Policy, this kind of a great books approach, big ideas approach to public policy. Uh, on the West Coast over there at Pepperdine. So that's kind of uh, a really attractive thing for me 
to kind of get involved in that, or I've already kind of, in, in a sense, been involved in that uh, already the last couple of years. So a school that takes the importance of ideas, it takes it deadly seriously, to me, is crucial. One quick example of this, let's play it out in uh, contemporary debates. We all believe in the idea of inalienable rights, God-given inalienable rights, human dignity, and all this. Well, in the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, there is a clause which says that signatories to the treaty, uh, they have a, quote-unquote, inalienable right to develop nuclear energy, close quote. I think it's Article 2 in the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. And, as you might imagine, the president of Iran, Ahmadinejad, uh, has been invoking that clause repeatedly, he and his minions, uh, to justify the development of nuclear energy. We have an inalienable right to develop nuclear... How, friends, Thomas Jefferson, where is he when you need him? How could that phrase work its way into this international treaty? Who put it in there? Who put it in there? I guarantee you, from what I know about Kings, no one from Kings who graduates and finds himself on a congressional drafting committee would allow such nonsense to work its way uh, into an uh, international treaty. That's why ideas matter, because they do have these real-world consequences. And that's why I think Kings is an incredibly important and strategic place to be right now, because you'll make that kind of difference with your graduates. Being the young uh, visiting guy here... Only 47. Uh, the, the last thing I want to do would contradict a previous uh, veteran speaker, so I'm not going to... Who's over 50. Who's over 50, exactly. Who's <laughs> um, <laughs> Who remain unnamed. Um, uh, depending on what you mean by doing moral violence, that's a, that's a pretty heavy, uh, loaded expression. Um, I th there are two statesmen who come to mind who were willing to work with bitter opposition in a profoundly personal, intimate way. Abraham Lincoln is one. You may have read Doris Goodwin Kern's book. Um, title? Um, title? Title? Out there? Um, uh, rivalry something? Team of Rivals. Team of Rivals. Where Lincoln consciously, deliberately brought into the cabinet during the Civil War people who excoriated him. I mean, called him the nastiest uh, names you could have possibly imagine. Absolutely excoriated Lincoln, brought him into the cabinet. Did he, comp did, he, did he do moral hazard to his soul by doing that? I don't think so. He did have to forgive. He had to, had to forgive on the spot and not hold a grudge. Another uh, uh, statesman who did that was Winston Churchill. He was an opposition backbencher. He was considered a warmonger uh, in the 1930s, warning against the Nazi threat. When he became the conservative prime minister, he brought into the cabinet Labor Party leaders who hated him. But he needed them. He needed a coalition government to take the country into war. So there was a higher purpose in both cases, right? There's a war. We've got to win. We've got to win the Civil War. We've got to, we've got to end this issue of slavery. We've got to beat the Nazis. We've got to have a united country to do it. Did they do war to their, did they do kind of damage to their souls? I don't think they did. Did they violate fundamental moral principles? And maybe that's something that might be suggested in those remarks. You know, to, to, to forge an alliance um, and then at the expense of then violating a fundamental moral principle, moral conviction, you've got to think long and hard before you do that. We were talking earlier about, you know, the, the, the essence of geopolitics is the ability to distinguish between different degrees of evil. You're going to have to make some hard choices. You may well have to compromise on a principle, which is an important principle, for the sake of a more important even or urgent principle. Um, to strike that alliance, to find that common ground. So I, I definitely think it's absolutely important to do it. You know, as young people, how do you develop that, that um, what we call it? it? It's a character issue. It's not, this is not just posturing, is it? You can't just posture your way into a kind of, a real kind of bipartisan, if you will, um, negotiating sort of spirit in the best sense. That's not a posturing thing. That's a character thing. So how do you develop the kind of character that you become that kind of winsome, but committed, principled person. Now, I, <laughs> I, you know, I, I'm an Italian from New York. I don't pretend to have those skills or that character. We shout first and ask questions later in my family, right? Um, At least you don't shoot first. We don't shoot. We shout first and don't shoot first. But we shout first and, and ask questions later. So I don't pretend to have that, uh, that set of character qualities still in my life. I aspire to them. I know them when I see them. And I want to become more like that because in so many ways those are Christian qualities. Of the, and and what, what do I mean by what qualities? I'm talking about the ability to forgive, uh, to not hold grudges. If you can go through life and not carry a boatload of grudges, you're doing pretty well. And the older you get, Marvin, I think you probably would agree, man, if you can get to midlife and not be just obsessed with the gr petty grievances and larger grievances that you've experienced along the way, 
there's been a measure of grace in your life. So that's critical to do. Bury the political hatchet, move on. Another character quality discipline is you've got to be able to see the good, the measure of good in the person that you're trying to win or to work with despite the flaws. And